So I think um, Nathan, are you right to? Yeah. Um, so yeah. So Nathan's um, done a piece, a new piece of writing in response to what what happened on the day there, basically. Yeah. So um, it's <coughs> it's really good to get the opportunity to do this uh, sort of um, presentation of this text, which is still very much like in a draft form. So it's kind of like interesting to sort of see how, how it works in terms of contextualising and sort of explaining the experience of the Jim Jam project which um, kind of was quite a mad <laughs> situation and quite a mad day um, and so it's just you know, we were trying to like work out different ways of documenting that through uh, this, the kind of affective quality of working in uh, this environment uh, and bringing art into it and that was like part of my brief, so that's what this text tries to start to do. Uh, it kind of just finishes quite, you know, quite bluntly, uh, but then I'll, I'll pose two questions at the end. Um, Howbridge is an immense leisure facility in the borough of Wigan in the northwest of England. The term facility makes me think of space stations. And indeed, as we walk up the path from the carport, it seems like the entire complex is hovering over the broken soil or has only recently embedded itself after falling from a 1970s cinema depiction of the future. What is this quality of council infrastructure? To appear as though it has recently arrived, hugely dated and uncannily alien all at once. The language of them now also not only evoking some imagined space age, but also demanding a form of engaged usage once imagined by socialist utopian sci-fi. Hubs we will revolve around and propagate from. Studios, where the only cameras are CCTV focused on rows of exercise bikes, like a scriptorium, where patrons produce knowledge in the pure, digitally documented form of physical exertion. A slogan on the wall, get what you wish for, get what you work for, tangling the cognitive and physical demands of this new self-imposed labour with something of the Big Brother style assurance. And 3D, 3G pitches, which apply additional gravitational force to produce the feeling of rushing through space while running after a ball. We are indeed spun out continually by leisure facilities, job centres, libraries, perhaps most particularly hospitals. Anywhere the corporate beast, its eggs laid in the civic body, finds a public apparatus in which to hatch. There are these contradictory, suspicious, retropian tro tropes creeping out coating every surface, an uncanny, flickering signifier covering the socialist dream that's crumbling behind. Meantime, melting our, in our inherent resistance to having our collective inheritance sold down the river. The Howe Bridge facility arches over this figurative river. It is one of those sites in which the holographic quality of image and language finds its greatest density, and also where its inherent glitches tear at us with the greatest insistence. In the hub, with its salad bar to one side, and an invocation to take our membership to greater heights on the other, we are pierced by loud pop music wrenching itself to shards through the ceiling-mounted speakers. There are no shadows anywhere, on the walls, images of sweaty bodies literally shattered into vectors. And on the screens, hyperspeed footage of a man doing bicep curls. But one of the local staff is studying this screen with a wrinkled brow. And there's something, something else about this video. The man completes 30 curls in 15 seconds and the video cuts to him on a leg working mechanism, like a metronome sticking to the same rapid but not frenetic pace. Something kind of unattractive, machinic about it. 
This video is the first artwork I encounter at Howbridge. It's survival as weird among the blizzard of weird that is Howbridge is exemplary of the subtle shifts of register that Redoc bring to their Jim Jams event. Among the questions I ask myself while I'm employed as a kind of roving thinker, lingering on balconies and occasionally refusing to take part in the range of activities is, is digital art, and in particular this socially engaged form of digital art, a way of dealing with an abstract menace? I'm thinking most particularly of the threat that our understanding of what is acceptable, normal, is beyond our control. We experience menace as a loss of control in its digital form so frequently that it can be difficult to disentangle from digitality per se. Perhaps the shifts that engineer encounters with what is really at hand, a sped up video acting no particular, adding no particular attractiveness to the act of bicep curling, but rather revealing it in its manifest absurdity, allow for us to discern somehow what it is that's disturbing about the weird, alienating systems, slogans and techniques of our time. Because Redox work is nothing if not technical, systematic. They arrange tables at which children must register to play games, where you wear a giant red button on your back. They stop you from skating in the skate park and ask that you play like robots to a metronomic blip. Posters advertise a high octane clash between sport and culture. But I think actually there is something in the hesitant, withheld nature of the Redoc actions in Howbridge that allows for them to perform the disarming, enabling of life as normal, so alien to the facility at large. There is a giant white helium balloon that leans against the wall, floating occasionally around the edge of the skate park, with two sciency looking blokes looking up at it. A group of children standing at the bottom of the ramp look at them steadily, perhaps feeling somehow more innocent without their helmets and knee pads on. Two announcers exhort people to take part. Do not be afraid, they shout, of robot rugby. The artists themselves wear silver hats, <clears throat> nervous, vulnerable in a way that only someone unprotected by procedure, but committed to it, can be. Meantime, over there, outside of the arts activity, other children dangle from self-retracting wires, climbing up cartoon facades of a jungle or a house before jumping and falling in slow motion to the ground. One adult commands five automatic ropes, a safety puppet master or organ grinder on some brilliant, terrifying visual tune. The sheer unbelievable jouissance of this activity, where one can fall without landing and jump between platforms raised 20 foot high in the air, only now placed beside an art intervention's regulatory impulse, seems strange. Like somehow we have gone physically as well as politically, too far into freedom. In another room, a dance begins. Children have learned a site-specific dance routine for the soft play area, led by one of the Redoc creative partners. Their gyr gyrations, genuflections and flaying limbs produce a flocking similarity, rather than strictly adhering to the music's throb. The netting posts and slopes of the soft play don't quite shape the pre-composed moves, but still there is something revealed in the appropriateness of this encounter with the materials of the facility, as though the children are pointing at the rhythms of the music, the absurdly loud, round, bright, massive climbing apparatus, sweeping their hands over it and making it tangible again. Pop music particularly is ever present, and so an organised dance like this draws attention to our implicit entanglements with it by accentuating and heightening them as movement. This interplay of the unrestrained 
activity and media of contemporary sports environment, the giantized sculptural forms of the soft play, the danger-free environments of the climbing walls, and the always partial, hesitantly controlling function of redox intervention is where the conceptual energy of this day is generated for me. I become fascinated by the opportunities for apparent limitlessness and the way they're offset by the implicit willed insufficiency of systems-based art. As well as saying something about leisure centres, which I think I've laboured enough, it seems to say something about art itself too, in particular the art of the digital sublime, the freedoms and fluidities offered by datafied art, the explosion of what is visible, the intricacies, scales, volumes, hyper-real finishes allowed by affordable digital technology, which are themselves tempered here by their interaction with the whims and unpredictabilities of bodies, personalities and materials. Um, so, I kind of, what I'm like, trying to get at, um, I'm sort of, um, going to sort of like try to keep returning to returning to is kind of two questions um, that this day kind of raised for me and I think like, hopefully for the group um, uh, and they are uh, one it's kind of about form um, sort of to what extent the, the sort of awkwardness that I've tried to highlight that almost like uh, is playing out against the not awkwardness of uh, leisure centres and council infrastructure in general um, this kind of like not working th that you mentioned about the technology mm -hmm. but also like you know the kits that we just tried the way that they you do have to sort of struggle to make them work um, what way that's like part of the critical and aesthetic um, fundamentals of critical kits sort of not working and clumsiness uh, and then the second question is kind of like if these works um, imagine audiences uh, <coughs> and future audiences and future populations as part of their material uh, what role does kind of the generosity of people uh, taking part in them um, have and you know to what extent then what I think was quite powerful working with children in particular because children they're like inherent generosity which can get sort of subdued by very easy to take part in activities and these their generosity with taking part in the redox stuff that was kind of quite restrictive in a way mm -hmm. was like part of like one of the magical things of the day um, yeah so this the one about generosity and the other one about um, awkwardness and not working mm -hmm. okay thank you Nathan. that was really interesting <laughs> okay I think um, really interesting questions to kind of go on with for the rest of the day um, yeah the um, I, th I thought there was something really interesting uh, that you were saying about the kind of the the, the kind of like the clash between attempts or, or kind of seeing, trying to trying to create systems that are informed by the digital sublime and they said say for example one of the activities was a um, this kind of mass choreography where we're trying to give people really simple instructions to, to then hopefully result in more complicated flocking behaviours with the group. Um, and just that, that kind of um, uh, the, the, the tension between the digital sublime of those rules and instructions and that programmatic system of thinking and the reality of um, like 70 odd um, kids who were really excited to be allowed to uh, wander around and, and stand on the, the BMX ball and stuff like that. It's, I think that clash is really interesting. Yeah, and then um, there's, like, you don't have to sort of, because obviously the nature of, like, an <coughs> algorithm is to, like, keep on going, like, keep mm -hmm. on doing itself, and that's one of the engines that produces <coughs> those beautiful visualisations, but mm -hmm. the way that you were doing that in that situation was to go, keep moving, <laughs> yeah, yeah, everybody yeah. keep moving, and it's yeah, yeah. like, you know, it's like, you know, it's really like natural. analog algorithm of just yeah. like I have to keep on saying and return to beginning loop, which yeah, is yeah. just keep moving. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah um, no, I'm glad you. I'm glad you highlighted that. But maybe um, that's the thing though about that sort of generosity idea. It's like, yeah, we are going to suspend the fact that we 
normally don't like being told what to do. Mm. We're gonna, mm. we're gonna, yeah, okay, well, I suppose I'll let them do that. So there is like this weird awareness of some sort of greater thing, mm. and and people all do pick up on that. The menace have been turned into a robot, but then, you know, we're kind of doing that a lot when we're using technology. Yeah, it's it's a some it's somewhere between sort of generosity to do something really creative and bigger than yourself and accept terms and conditions <laughs> <laughs> sort of things like, yeah, whatever. Um, so there's, there's a some weird meeting point. But I suppose the thing about it is that when you plan something uh, and, you, and, it's, and I suppose you end up with that night of the video of like the manager saying it's, you know, it's really good, it's, it works really well. You kind of miss it. It's quite hard to capture that those weird situations. So it's it's quite good to have a bit of text that you've written there and present that alongside what is normal, a normal mode of operation for documenting some sort of artistic work that you've done. Uh, cause, um, and it's, n not, it's nothing to do with um, Tim, I'm not having a go at you. <laughs> but, yeah, but, but you know what I mean, they are the that is the kind of standard thing and we need those videos to sort of understand them, but I think it's I think what this today is about is to try and think well, we could include a load of other stranger stuff that we all know is there, um, but we don't quite put it in our documentation. Or th there's so many things you mm -hmm. could put in your documentation of your kit or the design of your event, uh, and we're just saying we want more, <laughs> we want more stuff. Um, so it's just I think it's, it was really good to have your text alongside that video because I think that sums up what we're interested in that there is something missing this thing in the room that oh yeah I'm being made to behave like a robot but then when you're asked what did you do it's like oh yeah it was great I got to stand on the thing and, but it's like but what about the bit where you made to do a robot yeah well I was a bit uncomfortable but I wanted to do it you know we could have dug into that a bit and I suppose we're trying to just dig into things yeah, 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 yeah. A bit more. And, and uh, actually, like the part that I was most interested in was the the generosity of the people who are participating. Because, like, if you do the kind of work that I'm sure a lot of people do here, like working with communities or uh, the general public, you often, like, the survey at the end, did you enjoy it? Yes or no? Is not enough to find out how they felt about taking part. Did they feel like they gained something? Were they ex do they feel exploited or, you know, like, you have this kind of, like, you, like the kind of work that we do, we make kits, but do we think that, do we, do the people want them? Do they need them? You know, I think a lot of times you don't question whether the customer or consumer needs this, like a lot of other kind of like I suppose you, you can kind of use artistic license to say it doesn't have to be commercially viable so you kind of take out of the equation whether you know like people will buy it and use it yeah I, there's, there's something that um, about that that need relationship though that I think um, where sometimes if depending on who and what we're talking about you need people as artists. We need the participants like just as much as, or if not more than, they need. They need us, right? Yeah. So the, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Like, the that in a way that that sort of like whether they need the thing that you're making or not, it, in that sense, is irrelevant. Really, it's like you need them. We need them. <laughs> we need them. To, yeah, yeah. yeah. Do the thing to like make you know, because art is valuable of its own volition anyway, whether it's like needed by anyone is like for me not the only question whether it's useful. And I suppose it's like, difficult isn't it because it presents oh like this gym is just a gym, it's not enough, we need Redoc mm. to make other things happen, it's like but actually yeah but you could also think Redoc needs places that need, yeah, it needs yeah, all that just a perceived need. This, we need something more, something's not quite right, so as an artist you're kind of, mm. you're fulfilling, yeah, or you're requesting people to fulfill.
fulfill your needs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I suppose there's a question for critical kits as well, just thinking of just because we're appreciating the generosity of participants, that doesn't mean we should be like trying to. Um, I don't know, that can affect the tone of kind of kits and activities that you ask them to engage in. And I think maybe one way of appreciating that people are generous and open, particularly children, and they're kind of how generous and open they can be to, to like have a go at these activities, is to then ask them to do things that they maybe will find a bit uncomfortable or challenging. Or it's, it's kind of, there's, yeah, there's, there's something, the, I think the best way to appreciate that generosity is to ask them to do things which, which are maybe going to. You know, not to be really what think. It. Yeah, yeah, it's to push it, I think, in a way. But but I suppose that's a question for kits and the tone of kits, maybe. Um, so, should we? Because um, um, there'll, there'll be loads of time to kind of discuss some of this stuff about, uh, and particularly to talk about your kits as well. Um, but we were just going to, before we start talking about our own kits, yeah. um, we were going to do a bit of a, a kind of a mapping activity, looking at some of these kits from. Um, that artists have made over the past hundred years. Is that the top trumps? Uh, the top trumps, yeah, yeah. So um, we'll we'll maybe give people less time, give you less time to do that now because we're like well behind schedule. <laughs> but um, yeah, so can we split you up into four groups um, and ask you to? Uh, we've got um, three questions for this top trumps mapping activity. So we're going to give you a set of top trump artist kits cards. We'd like you to. I'll write this down in a second, but we'd like you to sort them in some way, so to arrange them into groups in a way that makes sense to you, um, and then to um, start to label and categorise these different kits, and just think about the relationships between these different kits as well, so um, be interesting to, to um, and then also if there's any artist kits or maker kits that you think are relevant to this discussion we're having today, um, We'll let you use a bit of paper and and, um, and add them to your. So if you're kind of making a bit of a cluster map um, of of these artist kit top trumps, if you, I think we might have to make these maps on the floor because our tables aren't particularly big. Should to do that um, in the back room. Should we split up and have maybe like one group here and then two groups in the back room? Yeah. Um, how about if we go, let's like two rows. Um, so like first two rows, um, uh, Chris and. Uh, Hi Young and Chris and Nathan, uh, yeah, and then next, the next row, and then uh, uh, Laura, <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> Laura, Andrew and Glenn, um, and you, and then, and then you guys there to form a group as well. Does that make sense? <laughs> Some people are going to go back.